So I'd like to welcome everybody to this conversation. Um, we, as a class, have been working together through uh, a lot of poetic experiments in the past two weeks. Um, we've been particularly inspired by Adwa Garji Zinga Greaves' work. Um, and so today we are going to be in conversation and she is going to be answering the questions that you have posed to her uh, about her practice, her process, um, her thoughts, um, and we'll be able to chat from there. So Adra Garji Zinga Greaves writes ethnobotanical literary criticism and collages detritus into heraldic devices, engaging ever expanding networks of reference through the granular analytics of poetic inquiry. She is the author of Close Reading is Forestry by Bella Donna, 2017, of Forests and of Farms on Faculty and Failure by Ugly Duckling Press, 2020, and is anthologized in Letters to the Future, Black Women, Radical Writing, Corre Press, 2018. Greaves has most recently been published in the Brooklyn Rail. She performs frequently across a broad spectrum of venues and educational contexts, and has begun working with video in response to a spring 2020 commission from the Issue Project Room for their isolated field recording series. Formerly a Monday night reading series curator at the Poetry Project, she uh, site director of Wendy for Wendy Subway Reading Room and artist in residence at Rauschenberg Residency, Greaves is currently based in New York City, where she's the young mother of the Floral Review, an emerging platform of literary criticism and network science centering floral language, its instances, applications, implications, and possibilities. In fall 2021, Greaves will enter literary, the literary arts program at Brown University as a candidate for the MFA in poetry. Please welcome Ajua. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here in conversation with um, these two institutions of learning, um, Artist Space and PS 140. Um, thank you all for your time and attention and curiosity um, today and tomorrow and in the past. I'm going to start by making a poem in conversation with the questions that I received from the eighth grade class. And then Rebecca and I will continue that conversation, um, bringing the insights from that poetic response um, into more conventional, um, but hopefully just as interesting and just as wide ranging conversation. So we can call this piece questions for Adjua. What got you into poetry? What inspired you to write poems? And does that same thing motivate you up until now? Why and for whom do you write? What is your process? What inspires you? Language. What do you find interesting about poems? Why poetry? What made you also want to work with images? Technology. Biology. How do you come up with ideas to start a new project? What are some resources you like to use? Solutions, crises, joy, beauty. 
do you make pieces that reflect on feelings? When you make your poems, how do you feel when you work on them? How does writing affect you? Does it help you deal with your emotions, feelings, etc.? Yes. Powerful. Absolutely. I noticed that you put maps in the first two pictures there. Why is that? Navigation. What got you into writing about plants? The police and violence and fear and hope. How does writing affect you emotionally? What does it feel like to write? How do you feel while writing? Where are feelings in your writing process? Order from chaos. Power through beauty. Improvement through creation. How do you feel while writing? I feel like I have a hammer and nails and tools and a sewing machine and a paintbrush and a typewriter and some beads and some braids and a frisbee and a balloon and a best friend and a sibling and a cousin and a big, big family. What got you into writing about plants? I noticed that even though I wasn't confused about why the police are dangerous and that they need to stop being dangerous. Even though I wasn't confused about that, I knew that some people I knew were confused and I didn't understand why. And when I would try to see how these people could be thinking that it's okay for the police who are supposed to protect people um, to see that instead the police were causing a lot of problems and they were introducing chaos into difficult situations and that often they were not helping anything. And I thought, why can't, why can't everybody see that we should not have people in society who are allowed to kill other people for their job? Why do people, why are people confused by that? And I started to look at the history of the United States and the violence of the history of the United States. And I started to look inside myself as somebody who was born in the United States and who has lived in the United States for 40 years. And I 
began to think, what part of me is clear headed about the violence of this country and what it asks us to sacrifice about our sanity to allow it to continue? And what part of me is still confused? What part of me still needs work? And I would ask that question and I started to think about how really the problem is that the police are not valuing every life as much as every other life. And when people think that the police are doing the right thing, it's because they also are not valuing every life as much as every other life. And I started to think, even though I know all human life is as valuable, as precious, as much as a miracle, as every other human life, no matter what color that human is, no matter where that human was born, no matter what that human speaks for a language. If that human being wants to be on earth for the good of everybody else on earth, then that is a valuable human being to me. It's simple like that. And I thought, okay, well, I'm clear from human to human. Some other people, they have work to do. They're not clear from human to human. So while they are doing that work over there, I'm not going to help them because it hurts my feelings to watch people confused. And I don't want to do that. So I'm going to turn over here to look inside myself and to say, is there anywhere that I am not a good citizen of the earth? Is there any way that I am acting like those people, those confused people? Am I acting like that to other living beings on earth? And I thought about it and I said, you know, I remember one time when I was small, I knocked over a potted plant in my mother's house and I thought I was going to get in trouble because I made a mess. But really, she was not angry at me. She said something very important instead. Without thinking, she saw the plant on the floor, and my mother said, oh no, they hate that. They hate that. And all of a sudden, when my mom said that, maybe I was the age you are, maybe I was 12, 13, 14. When my mother said that, the plant came to life for me in a way it wasn't before. Before, maybe it looked like a sculpture from the forest, or maybe it looked like a piece of artwork from the jungle. But when I had an accident and knocked over the plant, and my mother said, oh no, they hate that, I realized that the plant was alive in a way that I am alive. And yes, I'm a little embarrassed that it took me hurting the plant to realize that it is alive the way I am. Sometimes it's like that. Sometimes we're too far inside ourselves, and we can't see another being until we hurt that other being. 
hopefully more and more and more and more. We humans on earth that have a lot of power over other beings on earth, over dogs and cats and fish and cows and horses and spiders and bees and wasps and everything. Hopefully we will more and more and more be thinking about the ways that those creatures that might not look like they have lives like us, we can assume that they are alive. We can assume that they dream and that they have friends and that they have things to do that they like to do. And they have things to do that they don't like to do, that they have culture. We can assume that I think. Even if we don't have proof from a scientist, we can assume that. And I think it's better if we do. So I write about plants because I am very concerned about the power that human beings have and what we are doing with that power. I'm very concerned about those people over there that are still working on whether or not some humans are valuable. Like this is very sad that that is a question that people still have, but they do. I'm glad that they're finally working on it. But over here, looking at the rest of the work to be done, I want to make sure that I spend my time on earth making beautiful, interesting work that pushes forward the conversation about how important these slow, green, quiet, small, delicate living beings are and how important they are. And I hope that by the end of my life, which would probably not be until the year 2080, I hope that someone can say at the end of my life that I really made a difference in how plant life is respected and how much joy each plant feels because the humans around it are thinking more respectfully of its life. And I believe that through that kind of work in this direction, this future direction, it will bring along everything that our whole species needs to do from this side with the confused people to this direction where people are pushing forward. So that's why I write about plants. Also, they're very beautiful and they're very interesting. And I feel like it's something that I can do forever and still not be done. And so that's very exciting to me. I noticed that you put maps in the first two pictures there. Why is that? Um, the maps are something that I, um, I'm always thinking maybe with a map in my mind. I'm always maybe thinking with a map in my mind. Um, on the screen now, I think you can see a picture of a small part of a map that's really my heart and my mind. Those two fashion models, one person with short hair in this blazer and one person with long hair in a long yellow dress. Those two figures represent my parents and they are pointing at Lefrak City in Queens, which is when they were newly wed and my mom was going to be pregnant with me in 1979, 1980. That's where they moved to, to have a nice little family and when I think about New York City, I think about 
all of the different places that I have lived. I have never lived in the Bronx yet, but my cousins live in the Bronx, some of them. And my parents are both from the Bronx. They grew up a few blocks from each other. And I have lived in many places in Brooklyn. I've lived on Staten Island. I've lived in Manhattan. And the first place I ever lived was in Queens. And when I think about something like New York City, I think about it as the node in a network. I think about it as a part of humanity. Like I think about it as a place that lots of humanity goes through like a little funnel and comes out the other end changed because they came here or changed because they thought about here or changed because somebody told us told them about this place and when i'm walking around the city i think a little bit in a map of my relationship to this part of the human network. And I think about it in space. So maybe in math class, you're doing something like algebra where you have a graph with the X axis and the Y axis, maybe the Z axis. And I'm thinking about where I am going from, you know, two X to seven X or two X to Y down the avenue and over three blocks, seven X to five Y. I think in a map like that, and maybe you also think in a map like that when you are walking from one part of the city to another to get um, somewhere to see your family or to see your friend or to help somebody or to go to school or to go have fun. Um, I think that thinking in maps is something that maybe we are doing more than we realize it. And I love language for sure, but I also recognize that language is a technology that is on top of something that is maybe a biology, and that's a little bit reductive. We can talk about the word reductive soon, but it's maybe too simple. It's maybe reductive. It's maybe too simple to say language is a technology and what came before it is biology. But for right now, I will make a note to say, I love maps and I love diagrams and I love charts and I love information graphics because they do something with communication that verbal language cannot do, right? They do something all at once like a picture as opposed to instead of a story. You can see something called a tableau. Maybe it's a big painting of people having picnic on the grass and they have trees in the background 
and they have a few people on the picnic blanket and there's some food and everybody is relaxed. And there are other people in the background, further smaller in the back of the painting. We can start to see, as I say these words, we can start to see this image building. But if I show you the image, you understand all of that that I took 30 seconds to say, you understand it like that. You understand it in with a savings of 29 seconds. And if communication is what is important about language and image and expression, poetry, art, fighting, criticism, love, all of those things that are opposed and overlapping. I think that I love maps and you see maps in my work and you see a lot of love of language in my work, but not only through the use of language and not only through the use of prose, one word after the other in a paragraph. I'm really interested in communication. I'm not always privileging language, verbal language as the way to communicate. So that's why there are maps in my work. And I'm very glad that you're, I'm very glad that Rebecca chose to show you the maps in my work. This map that you're looking at now is a gift I was given by somebody working at Columbia University who was cleaning an old classroom. And this map is from maybe about 60 or 70 years ago, 1951 or 1961, I can't remember. And the language is too small for you to see right now, but there's language, there's verbal language and alphabet kind of language on this map. And it is in Russian. And this is a nice surprise for me because as we can see, the map is of Africa and we're not, I'm not used to seeing a map of anything in Russian because I'm not living somewhere where that's what I would see. But I'm especially excited to see a map of Africa, which is some a place that I have a metaphysical connection to and a biological connection to and a historical connection to, to see that place that I have distant connections to, to see that place represented by another thing that I have distant connections to, Russian language. It's very interesting for me, It's very interesting for me. So I have been living with this map of Africa that is titled Narodi Afriki, which means peoples of Africa in Russian, Narodi Afriki. Do you make pieces that reflect on feelings? How does writing affect you? When you make your poems, how do you feel when you work on them? When I make poems, I feel like a magician and I feel like a teacher. Um, I feel like a little deity. And it feels like a very beautiful secret 
to walk around looking at everything, knowing that I am a poet and knowing that I can sit down at any time I want or be moving fast at any time I want. And if I start to think about my memories, my distant, pes distant past, present, future memories, if I start to think about them with the poet I or the poet memory, the poet mind, with a desire to tell other people in a poem or through poetic thinking or through poetic conversation, I start to feel like I can do anything because I find that poets are, of all of the creative adults that I have met, they are the people who are able to think critically and make beautifully at the same time. They're able to take the raw material of their original language from their family of origin or a language that they learned or a language that they are curious about. They're able to take the technology of all of that language and break it down into its smallest little pieces and look at its smallest little pieces and fall in love with each of those small little pieces and understand how they fit together to make something that's so big you don't even have space in your self to love it as big as it is. You can only be in awe of it and grateful for it. That's how my friends and I think about language. And that's how we think about our art supplies, right? As a poet, your art supplies, your palette, your paintbrush, your hammer, your nails, your pen and your ink, it's all language, you know? It's all, it's, and it's every part of language. It's language that you hear that's very casual, like you would talk with your best friend when you are really feeling happy and you are teasing them or you are loving them or somewhere in between or you are inventing new language or you're hearing somebody say something you didn't understand and then you understand it or there's a new kind of language from that emerges from maybe something on the internet like a new kind of hashtag or a new kind of slang or a new way to use an emoji or a new way to use a language from another country. Like there's so much material and it feels really possible to process any feeling through the technology of using language as a creative tool and a critical tool, a making tool and a thinking tool. So that's part, that's some of how I feel when I'm writing. And yes, I definitely make pieces that reflect on my feelings. I think it might be impossible not to do that. I think even if somebody feels like maybe they are writing a poem that is not about their feelings, I would argue and maybe try to convince them if I felt like it was worth that effort I might try to convince them that 
their, maybe we could say, their serious poem about the history of a king in Belgium in 1700 AD, maybe somebody would write a poem like that and say, oh, I'm not writing about my feelings. You are writing about your feelings. But I would say, well, you felt like that king was important and you felt like it was important to put your heart and soul and time and effort and sacrifice and your knowledge, you felt like it was important to squeeze your brain to write this serious poem about the king. So that is also a feeling. So I make poems about my feelings and I have lots of different kinds of feelings. And I also think that is really the only thing that humans are ever doing. Sometimes it's easier to see that than other times. How do you come up with ideas to start a new project? What are some resources you like to use? This is where we'd go back to the idea of walking around the network node with the poet mind, right? I'm walking around New York City. This is my hometown. And I'm looking at the rest of my species. I'm looking to see how we're doing, I'm looking to see how much trouble we're in, how much beauty we're making. I'm looking to see if this is a day that I am concerned, or this is a day that I am safe, or this is a day when maybe we are pointed more quickly in a direction that is safer for everyone so that everybody on earth can have a more relaxed life. And just for a fantasy, if we are headed in a direction where we could potentially be free from problems and not have to protest and not have to fight and not have to just all of these remedial things, if we could just enjoy our time on earth and be glad that we woke up in the morning and not feel like we are in danger and just listen to the birds and have enough food to eat and have our friends close by and have other friends that we get to travel to see and have money to travel and have safety to travel and allow our parents to come with us and sometimes travel without our parents. If we could have a life where we just get to chill for 70, 80, 90, 100 years on earth, that would be so beautiful. And maybe it's possible, I don't know. But when I'm walking around the city, I'm thinking a little bit how far we are from something like that. I'm looking to see what's going on, what we're making, what we're breaking, and who is in danger. And if I get concerned that I can see something more clearly than someone else, and it's important to me that that other person know what I know for the good of everybody, that might be a time that I would start to write a poem. Or that might be a time where my poet brain is thinking, how do I solve this problem? Do I solve this problem with a poem? Do I solve this problem with a painting? Do I solve this problem with a very serious letter? Do I solve this problem with a text message? Do I solve this problem by telling the person, don't talk to me like that? Do I solve the problem by sitting down and crying? Do I solve the problem by standing up and crying? Do I solve the problem by sitting down and being angry? 
And do I solve the problem by standing up and being angry? Do I solve the problem with a conversation or with an action or with ignoring it or with creating something? All of those questions would make me think about making a new project or a new poem based on my observations. Some resources that I like to use are the Google Suite, not because I really trust or think that Google has my best interest in heart at heart. As a corporation, I don't think they do. But for right now, I really am grateful for their free networked software the elegance of its design, the power and nimbleness of its technologies, and that it's available everywhere with a low barrier to entry for many people, not all people, but a lower barrier of entry. So Google is a resource that I like to use. Um, I also, like to use a resource of the interview or the conversation. I find that there's a different kind of thinking that happens when I sit down to write something versus when I am talking to somebody, when I'm talking to you versus sitting down to think about answering your questions in an email. So a resource that I like to use is talking and a resource that I like to use is Google. <laughs> I also love to use books and I also love to use, maybe we could say parties or hanging out or friendship. I love talking to people about the things that they are reading. I love talking to people about the things that they are writing. I love talking to people about the things that I'm writing and reading. And my friendships more and more and more are deepened because we are making work together or we are making work alongside one another. And our friendship shows up in the way we are thinking and our friendship shows up in the way we are reading and making and reflecting and editing our work. So that's another resource that I like is friendship. And in terms of friendship as broadly as possible, we could think about friendship as intimacy and warmth and support and encouragement. And those are all feelings that I have when I am happy and I'm reading books because especially that gives me a kind of friendship interaction, a kind of friendship access to the minds of people that I'll never meet because they live somewhere else or they're very busy or they're not alive anymore or we don't speak the same language. But through books, I can have more and more and more of those collaborative friendships over time and space. So the four main resources that I use to make my work are Google, Friendship, books and talking. What do you find interesting about poems? Why poetry? I love poems because they can literally be anything. They can be one word. They can be two words. They can be five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. They can be 140 syllables, they can be 
rhyming, they can be not rhyming, they can be scary, they can be funny, they can look like poems and they cannot look like poems. I find it interesting that a poem can be anything in a different way than maybe some other art forms. That's an open question for me. Right now I'm obsessed with poems, so that's all I see. And I'm really happy for that obsession right now. But I'm also open to a future when I'm thinking in the same kind of all consuming way about other forms of writing and other forms of making. But that's what I find interesting about poems. Their enormity, their flexibility, their, how ancient they are. They're, it's an ancient art form that is still existing and still being made today. We are making one together right now. And I find that, as I said before, the poets that I know are the teachers that are the most kind to their students. And they are the teachers that are thinking most critically about how to make the world better. And they are artists that are very generous, typically, intellectually, in their sociality, their relationships, with other artists. I'm very grateful for that. What made you also work with images? Well, going back to the biology and technology question, I think that we come into the world working with images, that if we are sighted, if we have sight, we are first processing information about our surroundings through images. Eventually, we get introduced to the kind of images that represent sounds that we speak from our mouths, right? This is an image, but we also know that it is two words, New and York. So I would say that we are all working with images. Sometimes those images are shaped into language and sometimes they're not. What got you into poetry? What inspired you to write poems? And does that same thing motivate you up until now? Why and for whom do you write? What is your process? What inspires you? I got into poetry maybe by accident because the artist felt the best. But then looking back, I realized that I had been into poetry for a long time, that I loved King Lear by William Shakespeare, where a king goes crazy because he is obsessed with power and he realizes that he's going to lose his family in his confusion. And he goes out into a swamp storm and he meets a clown and the clown is crazy. And in the clown's craziness, and in the chaos of his heartbreak and his confusion, this king goes so crazy that he becomes sane. I love that story. I love that story. That's King Lear by William Shakespeare. And I think of that as one of the first poems, you know? It's a play, but
but I think of it as a poem because it's the language is so beautiful because the because the artistry of it is so um, because the artistry of it is so what is that word is so exuberant because the range of its human engagement is so enormous. I think about another poem called the rhyme of the ancient man the rhyme of the ancient mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge it's very old very strange also about going mad and it's about a man who's on a boat and there's a storm and i forget exactly what's happening but he I think either he kills a bird or a bird dies and he becomes connected to this bird. It's an albatross, a large white bird. And I don't remember what that story is, but I do remember I loved that epic poem. I loved how scary and sad that story was and how beautifully it was told. And then even before that, I remember my father teaching me when I was very young how to write a short poem that maybe you have heard of this kind called a haiku where there are two different kinds as far as I know one has one kind has five lines or uh, five sounds then seven sounds and then five five syllables seven syllables, five syllables. And I think there is another version where it's three syllables, five syllables, three syllables. And I think that the traditional haiku form is painting a picture. You know, like you want to use those 17 or 11 syllables to say, look at this beautiful bird in the sky over the lake. I'm thinking about my mortality. You know, um, that's not that, that's not the right amount of syllables, but that's the kind of painting that might be picked, that's the kind of picture that might be painted with words in a traditional haiku. Um, and I really loved that. and. My father did a great thing by teaching me at a very young age, a creative technology that I could repeat over and over again, because it was not more complicated than I could remember as a young child. And it was not more, and, and it was something that I could I could press that button again and again, as long as I remembered his instructions and a lot, as long as I was interested in this form, I could try again and again and again. So maybe we could say officially, my father introduced me to a haiku form of poetry, a Japanese form of poetry when I was a young child and because it was something that I could play with and experiment with, I felt like poetry was always for me. And then I feel like my process is to try to write with my whole body, not just writing from up here through my hands, right? But to write with my insides as well, to write from the whole self, not to pretend like maybe 
the serious person who thinks that they're, or the person who thinks that their serious poem is not about feelings, that it's just from their mind. No, I don't want to be writing like that. I want to write from my toes and my shoulders and my back as well. And I want my work to feel like it came from me and also from everywhere. I want it to feel like my work always existed and the audience is just becoming aware of it. Um, and to end this poem, I will answer the final question. Why and for whom do you write? And I'll answer that with a little story that about 15 months ago in January of 2015, I was leading an artist residency in Florida in the middle of February, actually, February 14th, we were leaving an artist residency. And one of the women that I was, one of the artists that I was in residence with, she gave me the most beautiful compliment after four or five weeks living on the Robert Rauschenberg estate together with a few other artists and seeing how I always wanted to make a party, involve everyone in the conversation, um, you know, go on a trip together, um, you know, kind of create in, create in conversation with other people. She saw my sociality as part of my art practice and she saw my art practice as part of my sociality and she gave me a really beautiful compliment, which was to say, you were always here for all of us. And I've really never been more proud of myself in the eyes of somebody else than in that moment. And that's how I try to write as well. I try to write for everybody. I'm writing in a black femme, United States citizen, English speaking, 40 year old, beautiful body. But I'm trying to write and I'm trying to create in a way that's, that serves the eventual well being, the future well being of every, every part of Earth, um, every living being, every table, every mountain, every pen, every piece of garbage. I really want to be here for everyone always. Thank you. Thank you so much for this incredible like collaborative composition. It feels like truly an honor to be able to just bask in that um, and also to feel this uh, really expansive dialogue going on between your work catalyzing the work that we've been working on together in class, catalyzing your answers um, in this kind of you know, circular motion, which is really beautiful to see. Um, I was wondering, could I follow up with a few questions? Yes, I would love that. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I, I love talking to you too. <laughs> we can do this all day. Yeah. One of the things that was really fun about listening to you is that I was taking a lot of notes. <laughs> Would Will you send me that? That looks so wild and beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, oh my in, my, God. in my wild handwriting. Yes. Uh, Please. But that really, I feel like that becomes one of the parts of your practice is making more, like 
planting a seed that then generates a lot more, um, these expansive tendrils. And so that got me thinking a lot about your citational practice and quoting and all of that um, as a way to situate yourself um, and then also a way to bring in an outside uh, into it, to engage in a conversation and doing something different with that. Um, and I feel so compelled by uh, the, the singing citation in your performance. Uh, we've been working a lot with citation, um, mm -hmm. quoting, using what, what you did. So I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about where the, the singing comes in um, and how or if that relates to um, being able to, using writing as a way to make a bigger conversation, not to close things off, but rather this, this point to open things up, um, maybe to a broader range of life, a broader mm. range of making um, than, than sometimes we, we think is possible. Um, yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, you know, I just, I was just talking to my aunt yesterday about the way my uncle Bill reads or used to read when he was alive. And we were talking about how he wrote in the margins of his books also. And I'm remembering a friend I had who once, I think was teasing me a little bit, but I didn't accept it as teasing. But they were like, I think they didn't understand or they didn't value my marginalia practice in the same way that I did. You know, they didn't, I don't think that they recognized it as my mind in conversation with the published mind, you know. Um, but that's really what it is for me. It's really like, you know, the, the published book is not a gated community that we are not invited into. It's a public park, you know? It's a public park that doesn't close even between the hours of 1 a.m. and 5 a.m., you know? You can go there whenever. And writing in the margins and annotating shows that you were there. That's what it is. And I think as somebody publishes a book, that's what they want. They want everybody to read it. They don't want, they, you know, I don't care who it is. I don't care how special they are or how, you know, how even if they were thinking bad thoughts and they thought that they were better than other people, they still want every single person to read their book, you know? Because they, like, as my, as my friend says, when you squeeze your brain like that, you know, you're doing, you're working hard. You want people to see that you worked hard, you know? And it's, I think it's a kind of respect for the author to really deeply engage that work because they wrote every single word, you know? they or their editor or some combination. Somebody wrote every single word that exists. You know, that's intense. <laughs> that's really, I don't think I've ever thought about it like that. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of, people have done a lot of work. I don't always feel proud of humans, but sometimes I do. It's in, in moments like that, I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, and I would also say, I just learned something really interesting about why there are margins of books. It's apparently because, it's a little bit surprising, I'll say, but it's apparently because like the kind of glue that they used to use or something about how books were first printed or where they were stored or what life was like in general um, when books first existed, it was like very, very likely that the edges of a page would get nibbled on by rats. So they had to put 
the content, the important part had to be far enough away from the rat's teeth um, so that even if there was some nibbling around the edges, you still would be able to read the book in the future. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. Oh, just what I feel like, I mean, both like as a New Yorker and having this like innate reaction to rats, which I, you see a little too more than you might want, but also thinking about how then the, the book becomes this like compost material, maybe a little bit. Um, it goes through this, goes through that process. Um, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. That's a beautiful way of thinking about it too. I love, I love using the margins as a way of honoring a yeah. writer, um, you know, to celebrate people loudly and quietly and to yeah. the conversation. I like the way you said that. Yeah, loudly and quietly. I was also thinking about, you said, think critically, make beautifully. And, oh, I wrote that and then I circled it. Uh, <laughs> what an honor, oh my God. <laughs> uh, and you also spoke a lot about the, uh, that your writing is derived from thinking about violence and thinking about beauty. Um, and I think that a lot of times when we're writing poems, we maybe think that we have to think of these things separately. Um, I have to write a poem that is being critical of the violence in the world, or I have to make a beautiful, this poem has to be pretty, this poem has to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the invitation that these things actually have to exist together, or maybe poetry is a place where they can exist together. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, your relationship to beauty. Uh, oh. Making Absolutely. <laughs> wow. Um, beauty was my first kind of spiritual, intellectual quest. You know, I grew up um, in going to school in Manhattan, living in Brooklyn, in downtown Brooklyn, and then on the northern shore of Staten Island, in downtown Staten Island. And I saw so many different things and my life was both very easy and also very difficult. Like, it, you know, I'm still sorting out which one of us, um, who <laughs> we may never know. Um, and the through line, the thing that kept me inspired the whole time was that I knew that sometimes I was able to float above all the weirdness and access something like you know, what a Christian person or a religious person might call holy, you know, like really like something that brings you floating in your self. Um, and for me, it was, you know, maybe now I would say it would be beautiful photo composition or beautiful color pairing or beautiful poem or, you know, elegant graphic design or watching a pigeon take flight or watching a storm roll in. It was a huge range of things. And I was just so curious. I was like, what is this feeling? You know, like, what is this feeling? What is this thing? that makes me not stressed out about my weird school that I went to where everyone was, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> where, where the teachers were kind of mean, you know, where the teachers were mean. And it was a good school, but like in the way that it was good, it really hurt me. It really hurt me, you know? Um, but it was a good school, so. I, that's there and lies the confusion. Um, but, you know, I was like, what is this feeling that brings me up out of that fam familial and educational feeling of emotional neglect? Like, what is that feeling that makes me feel, what is that thing that's making me feel better about life, you know, and good about life? Um, and so I started, I tried to figure out like what it was. I was like, well, I know that beauty is, you know, this is, I'm like 
14, 15 at this time. I'm like a year older than um, your students, you, you all. Um, and I'm thinking, I'm like, what is this thing? And I don't remember anymore exactly what I was, what my search terms were, but it was, the internet existed at that point. It was 1995. Certainly the internet existed for a long time, but I mean, the World Wide Web existed and my mom was able to, um, my, and we had a computer at home, you know, uh, and eventually I had my own computer too, you know? So I felt I had access to a way to like deal with my curiosity through, you know, it wasn't Google then, but like searching. And I wish I remember, I wish I could find those first searches, but it was really basically something like, um, I was like, mm, when I say beauty, I mean <gasps> this beautiful feeling. I don't mean Naomi Campbell, who was like a superstar, who's still a superstar, but like was a superstar at the time. Um, you're like, I don't mean the way that she's beautiful, but also she's beautiful in a way that really inspires me too. So like, what, like, what is that feeling? And I eventually figured out that a way that I could talk about it or a way that I could get more information about it was through the word aesthetics and through pairing something with like art and beauty, you know? Um, and so that, that opened my, that, you know, once I found that keyword, I had, you know, the, the, the gate opened, but it took, it took a little while to figure out, um, cause I don't think I was asking anybody, you know, there probably, maybe there was somebody I could have asked. I had a really wonderful art teacher named Dwayne Neal. Um, hi, Mr. Neal, if you ever see this, love you. Um, I had a really wonderful art teacher um, and I probably could have asked Mr. Neal, you know, but I didn't think of it at the time. Um, and, you know, I also could have asked um, Miss Minakakis. She was my like middle school English teacher. Um, I probably could have asked Colia O'Connor. He was uh, my high school one of my high school English teachers, you know, like there probably were kind people who could have helped me with that at the time, but it didn't feel like it because of all of the painful stuff that shouldn't have been happening. Um, you know, I, I, I had no reason to trust, you know, anybody with my intellectual spiritual journey. So I did it by myself. Um, and I, I also probably could have asked my Spanish teacher, Senora de Toledo, or my history teacher, Ileana Pergam, you know? Like I did have people there for me, but I couldn't see them. I just wanna say that um, just as a reminder for people still in school, um, keep looking. If you're not finding who you, if the people most in charge of you are not giving you what you need and you don't feel safe with them like keep looking you have a lot you have more people than you realize you have more people than you realize and people see you even if you don't initially notice it so keep looking yeah um but specifically about art and beauty that's really that was the beginning of everything for me that was really a, a kind of soul soul healer um quest brought me brought me here to you like you know 25 years later <laughs> pretty cool I love that yeah um especially thinking about how I think so much of your work redefines terms for us we get new definitions of things you know um well, or our challenge to to push ourselves further yeah. you know we have to think bigger about life. We have to think bigger about beauty. Um, we have to be think bigger about who keeps us safe and how we keep each other uh, safe, or maybe we don't, um, and how, how to push through that. Um, another thing that I was thinking about uh, is how your work, you know, we get biology, we get uh, <laughs> spirituality, we get 
Did you hear me start talking about algebra? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have algebra. I'm so you know a, a lot of the times um, you know we get to class and the you all have just done your math class, um, and so now I'm a little bit maybe I'm being be pushing too far, but I'm a little bit like why do we need that if we have poetry? Uh, not entirely, but um, I'm yeah. So I'm thinking about what does poetry how are we able to think all these things together in poetry? Where, where are we able to do biology and algebra and mythology and all of that together and sociology and, you know, critical studies? All of that is happening in poetry. While also, you know, like you said, it's not just, okay, you do these things, but it's still about emotion. There's still about um, there's still feeling in this. So we're doing biology, but we're doing biology also through our feelings. Mm. Um, so I'm interested in hearing about how we tap into the vulnerability of ourselves um, in working through, uh, you know, the universe in poetry. So how are we able to get all of these disciplines, all the classes that we take outside of, you know, uh, 10 to 10.45 on Thursdays, <laughs> poetry class, um, how we're able to get all of that into, get all the outside into poetry, and then also thinking about, you know, what, what you would say about how to, how to tap into that vulnerability, or how to yeah. allow that to speak. Um, I think it is something very elemental, and I think maybe if you talk to me around this time next year, I will have studied like the history of poetry in a deeper way. So I will know, I'll be able to be like, boom, 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 you know? But I think that it's something like this. I think maybe one of the first linguistic art forms was poetry, you know? Or maybe it's stories around a campfire. I think probably there would be a debate between those two, but it's definitely seems like it would be something that could happen in a social gathering around a campfire, I think. Um, maybe as students, maybe you've already been introduced to this, um, but if you haven't yet, there are these, the first, the earliest record so far that we have of paintings are, um, these prints that look like um, they were made by human hands um, on a wall um, inside, like in a mountain. Um, in the, I think, I'm pretty sure it's still true that it's in France, the caves of Lascaux. I think it's probably likely that that's a Eurocentric um, you know, demarcation, I'm sure that there is evidence other than in France, you know, but um, that's where the, that's where, that's the current public agreement, right? Um, but there is this art form that we say is the earliest art form which is images of animals on the plains in a uh, in in markings that look like they were done by humans, right? Um, and then there's also and there's recently some new um, some new indication that maybe the people, or maybe the entities that were making these markings were doing so in a slightly like altered state because there was like less oxygen in the cave, which is interesting. Um, and I would say that, you know, there's an unsafe way to engage art practice, an unsafe, unsustainable way to engage art practice that is really not the best way to go about it, which is that like getting to an exalted holy state through, um, through 
through something outside of yourself, you know? Um, but I think there's also a way to generate that exalted holy state, transcendent state, transcendence um, through a kind of meditation or meditativeness, you know, not sitting down cross-legged on a pillow kind of meditation, but like a focus, you know? Um, Sorry, I get so excited about all the things I was talking about that I don't remember your question. What was your question? Uh, well, that was like a big, big first part of it. You know, what is poetry? Why poetry? Why is it able to get into everything? Why oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I, so, so there's that kind of demarcation of like early art forms, right? But then I've also heard people be like, you know, the first artists were or the first storytellers were not, you know, doing it, um, you know, in the New Yorker magazine. <laughs> they were sitting around the campfire talking about something that happened to them. And they probably weren't, e it probably wasn't even fiction, you know? It probably was, oh my God, you'll never believe what happened. This tiger almost ate me today. Get a load of this, you know? like storytelling in that way. Um, or like, I saw this most incredible fruit today. I brought it here. This is where I had to climb. This is a river I had to cross to get to it. You know, I think it's always about sharing information. Um, and yeah, it's so interesting. I've never thought about this before that probably their first art forms were not fiction, you know? Um, because why would they be? There's enough real stuff to talk about, but fiction is also so cool in part because it allows you access to these other alternate dimensions of what could be happening, you know? It's, I love it. I'm very, very, very impressed and inspired and kind of in awe of fiction writers because I kind of don't know how they do it in a way that makes it so real. I, I love, love fiction. And something we noticed when I worked at McNally Jackson Books um, after college, I worked there and we recognized that we had the poetry books. Um, well, we thought about them as literature, right? But they weren't fiction. Like most poems aren't fiction, which is like kind of not what you would think initially, right? Because the most popular literary art form, the most profitable literary art form is fiction right now. And yet the most kind of revered literary art form is poetry, right? We don't, I don't think that we have a novelist laureate, right? We have a poet laureate, right? But it's like, it's like, I so all so all of this to say like there's something elemental going on. I th I think that maybe I've heard somebody make the argument that you know the first verbal art forms were song or poems you know or or, or stories I I don't know exactly I, I I do want to know that I don't I don't. I don't know what the public consensus is yet. I don't know what the critiques are. I can't wait to find out. Um, but I mean, I have this plan slash dream of starting a new school called the history of poetry where we don't have math class and we don't have you know science. We just read every single poem and we find we find what we need to about what we need to learn first in poetry, and then we can go find the mathematician and drill down into how to do algebra, you know? And we have an inspired reason for why to do algebra, because we're, we, we're like, our gut is so moved and cared for by, the beauty of what we found in this poem, you know? Um, there's a short poem called, 
I forget what it's called. It's by I think it's by Mary Oliver. Call and I forget I forget exactly what it is, but it's so funny. It starts off. Oh, I think it's called poetry, and the so I think it's called poetry, and the first line is, "I too dislike it," and then it's something like you know. But but after giving it, I mean, it's more beautiful than actually. I should just read it because it's so good. Um, I want to read that. I want to read that poem and also um, a short one by Hanif Abdurraqib because it's um, they both do something with beauty and poetry that I think are really useful. Um, and I will just say that. Um, forgive my googling while we talk. Um, um, there's there's something that's like i think i think that it is the source i mean i don't know why i think this it's a little bit um chauvinist for me maybe like i just think it because i'm in this world right now and i want to think it you know and it's not hurting anybody yet for me to think it so i'm giving myself the space to do it, but I should, I should chill and, you know, come down off the poetry hyper fandom pretty soon. Um, but I think that it is, or at least get more facts, <laughs> um, <laughs> one or the other, chill or get more facts. Um, I think that it's somehow functions as a source material or a, or a core mode of operations in the arts. And I don't know why exactly. I can't express more about why I think that. Um, anyway, this is the, so the poem is called Poetry. It's not by Mary Oliver. It's by a poet named Marianne Moore who lived from 1887 to 1972. And it goes like, it, the first part of it, it's a little long, I'll only read the first part, but I love this. Um, and I'm, I'm saying this because it's like, this is an art form that in just a few words can do anthropological comedy, literary criticism, you know, transcendence. You know? Um, poetry, I too dislike it. There are things that are important beyond all this fiddle. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, one discovers there is in it, after all, a place for the genuine. And then it goes on. It's, I mean, it's great. It's one of, one of, the, one of the greats. Um, and then I will say briefly, um, this is a poem I encountered last night. Um, by Hanif Abdurraqib, um, who's an extraordinary contemporary poet. Um, this poem is called, How Can Black People Write About Flowers at a Time Like This? Written by Hanif Abdurraqib. And um, the title is because during the racial uprising, um, Hanif, overheard somebody critiquing a black poet for writing about flowers and his eyebrows went up too <laughs> my eyebrows did too and yeah all the way and Hanif's response one of Hanif's responses was to write this poem about um thinking about powers, thinking about flowers and thinking about imbalances of power and thinking about apology. How can black people write about flowers at a time like this, written by Hanif Abdurraqib. Forgive me for I have been nurturing my well-worn grudges against beauty. I am hoping my neighbors will show me, I am hoping my neighbors will show some mercy on me for backing my car into the garden and crushing what I will say were the peonies, a flower with a short season, born dying. Some might say it's a blessing to know your entrances and exits. Forgive me, I 
forgive me. Some might say it's a blessing to know your entrances and exits. Forgive me, for I have once again been recklessly made responsible for the creation of, for I have once again been recklessly made responsible for the curation of softness and instead returned with another torrent of viciousness. In the brief moment of their flourish, at the opening of spring, I drove across state lines to gather peonies for a woman who loved me once as a way of surrender. I pull the already dying thing from the earth in a mess of tangled knots, and I insist that you must keep it alive for a year. Even after it so desperately wants to be done with the foolishness of its living. The last thing I ask of this relationship is to burden you with another relationship. It is so delicious to define the misery you are putting a body out of. And just like that, we are talking about power. How awful this must be for you, I whispered as I closed my eyes and put the car into reverse. That's the poem. Isn't that? Hanif. Hanif is from um, Columbus, Ohio. And the um, brief bio for Hanif says, Hanif Abdurraqib, how can black people write about flowers at a time like this from a fortune for your disaster copyright 2019 by Hanif Abdurraqib? Uh, used with the permission of Tin House Books. And I experienced this um, last night listening to a podcast called On Being, which I highly recommend. Yeah. Thank you for that beautiful, also like a collage of thought, <laughs> which is kind of the incredible way, th thing that happens listening to you speak as we get, uh, we also get all this collage um, and it makes me think of how maybe one of the radical things about poetry is it lets everything in um oh yes yes Aj was amazing so ev everyone should see this incredible work by I'll, I'll let you I'll let you wait I oh, you can do it <laughs> yeah. I I'm just gonna I feel like this is the perfect place to maybe frame one more question great um, which is uh, two, well, one and one, one question and one thought, uh, which is uh, a lot of this has also reminded me of Audre Lorde's Poetry is Not a Luxury, yeah. uh, which is also maybe one of the special things about poetry is that it's, it's both very hard, but also very easy to make. Uh, you know, it doesn't really cost money to write right. a poem. Right. You need a notebook. Uh, you need a pen, you need paper, or uh, some technological device to write on. I would um, say you could just remember also. Yeah, it, 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 those a were, little, a short, a short thing, or a long thing. Yeah. Yeah, and you remember that quote, you know, <laughs> like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I feel like there's this kind of poetry lets everything in, and maybe it lets everyone in, and that's a dangerous thing, wow. but it's a very possible thing. Um, and so, one one thing that one qu last question that relates to this incredible thing that we're looking at now um, is you were once a 14, 15, 13 year old New York City poet. Um, what is something, what is one piece of advice that you would give to an eighth grade poet about to graduate, about to go to high school in New York City in 2021? Wow. I would say walk around and look at as much as you can and talk to as many different kinds of people as you can 
about as many different kinds of things as you can. And don't, please don't assume because it's simply not true, you will find that it's simply not true. Don't assume that other people know more than you. They might know different things than you, but they need to know what you know. You are an expert in the life that you are living. You are already an expert. You already have expertise that is worth sharing and other people have expertise that is worth sharing. And then there are people who also go and get more information because they want even more information, right? But just living a life, you already become an expert on that life. And then you also have the opportunity to gather more and more information. And you can do that so many different ways. You can do that by walking around. Living in New York City is a miracle. We're, we are and are not at the center of some part of human consciousness. And it's not to brag that I say that. It's because there is some layer of metaphysical reality in which that is true. And we should live with respect to that. We should operate in New York City with respect to the fact that the whole world is watching what happens here. And it's really, really, really special to be born here or to be a young person here and to get to know the world through this node of the network is, um, I wouldn't say a privilege because privilege you know, falls apart but I would say it's an honor. It's an honor to, to live here as a young person. So go everywhere, talk to everyone, read everything, watch everything, listen to everything and think your thoughts, you know, and tell people about it. And, you know, make little, make little writing teams with your friends and make little book clubs with your friends and make little movie clubs, you know? Like we have, it's so cool to have access to information and, you know, you could bring your families into that, you know? Think about what your mom likes, what your brother likes, what your dad likes, what your grandma likes, what your grandpa, your uncle, like let's have book clubs with our families, you know? And let's have like movie clubs with our professors, you know? Like let's just do, the culture sharing all the time um, and blur those lines of the hanging out and the studying, like they can be both. They can be both. That's what I would say. That's so beautiful. Yeah, I think uh, the best advice that a poet can give you is maybe what your parents fear, which is say, talk to strangers sometimes or yeah. watch strangers sometimes. In, in a, in, Within reason, yeah. Within reason, but yeah, yeah, take it all in. Um, and abolish hierarchies of Absolutely. who you talk to and who knows what. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Um, assume, so assume that everyone is an expert and you will draw out their expertise. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So to close out, do you want to talk about? Yeah. So I wanted to show you this picture because um, I was so happy to realize I still had it. Um, this is a collage that I made in kindergarten. Um, you can see on the top left corner, you can see um, my early, early handwriting. <laughs> You can see it says A, D, J, <laughs> U, A, <laughs> um, and it's a collage um, that I made, you know, in um, 1985, I think, um, and I love how much I can still relate to the aesthetics here, you know, there's a tension between 
a, you know, tension not in the like fighting way, but a tension in terms of a dynamic way or the vibe, the vibe, there, there are multiple vibes here, right? There's an open vibe and a closed vibe. There's a bird and there's a tree, but the bird is taking up the most space and the tree has a lot of space around it, right? There's a lot of people in a kind of blue cast. And then there's one person with white mostly behind them. And then there's one person in a kind of pink cast with black behind them, right? And I was raised in a Christian household, which is why I think that it's a little girl with a halo, like a little angel is on top looking down probably in my five-year-old Christian household of origin mind, that's where that figure belonged because somebody told me that, you know? I would say now, maybe that's a spirit of transcendence is up there, you know? And I wouldn't necessarily have that spirit of transcendence and exaltation be a young blonde child, you know? I also love that there are young people and older people and there are people together in so many of these images. Um, and I love that it's a mess, but also there's clear order there, you know? Um, and Something that Rebecca and I were talking about um, earlier this month is how um, the kind of poem that I made from your questions today is a kind of collage, right? Like maybe the piece of paper is the fact that we're is Zoom, maybe the bird and the tree are your questions and maybe the figures in between are my answers you know um and there's a way that i love this image because it shows me that even though as an adult artist with their first solo show at a risk you know at a really well regarded institution like I'm making collage but I was also making collage at the beginning of my life and maybe I've never stopped making collage when I think about the kind of essays that I was writing in school thinking about something like Shakespeare's King Lear and thinking about the way the nature the, the natural world of that poetic play draws out the humanity that this powerful man needed, right? Maybe there's a way that I could have written my Shakespeare essay not citing Shakespeare and saying my own stuff and sh citing Shakespeare and saying my own stuff, but that's how I wrote it. You know, I wrote it um, in collage in that way because that's how we were taught to write literary criticism. And I love thinking about the range of this artistic critical gesture um, with all of those possibilities. Thank you so much for sharing this with us and collaging that thought as well. Yeah. I cannot wait for your retrospective where this is in the, you know, front room. <laughs> and it's also really exciting because in a few weeks, our all the eighth grade poets are also going to be published and have kind of, I mean, I'm sure so many of them have been making work prior to this, but it's a really exciting moment to, to get to see their work um, published and shared um, 
and be respected for the incredible work that it is at, yeah. at a younger age and allowing, yeah. you know, allowing the work to be an occasion for thinking, an occasion for sharing, an occasion yeah. for gathering. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I would love to see that. Yes. And you were given a VIP guest pass to the Young Artist Perform Day, um, which will be coming up soon. Okay. Where, uh, many folks that we know are going to be reading the poems for uh, these incredible oh. young writers. Right. And you will also be getting uh, the, the anthology, which should be mm. the date TB, TBD. Um, Great. But that will be exciting too. Yeah. So thank, thank you so you. much for joining us, uh, for engaging with all these incredible questions, um, for your generosity of time, and for all, all your makings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, to the class for your excellent, excellent questions. And thanks for your attention today. And um, thank you, PS140 and Artist Space and um, Sarah, Jay, and Kate, everyone in the background making this possible. And thank you, Rebecca, for being such a wonderful interlocutor. Always, always. This is a delight. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you.